It's a rainy day. Not much else can be said about the weather. I wanted to do garden work today, but it looks like I'll stay inside instead. Sitting underneath the slanted windows during downpour is a favorite activity of mine, but it wouldn't make for a particularly interesting YouTube video in the long run. So instead of watching the day pass by from the view from the couch, I'll go ahead and work on my servers. By logging into my VM host, a resource utilization of above 90% is revealed on both the CPU and GPU. That's exactly the amount I wish to be utilizing my hardware. After all, unused hardware is wasted hardware. The problem is though, I plan to expand the amount of work that this VM host has to carry and the change in workload burden will be bringing it to a grinding halt. I can't have that and must upgrade it. I'll start off by sending a power off signal to the guest OSs of all the virtual machines. This takes a bit longer than merely yanking the virtual power cord, but it does have the added benefit of preventing data loss. And as I've said before, I don't care about machine time on non-time sensitive tasks. When the virtual machines are all powered down, the VM host can be safely put into maintenance mode and also powered off. Once the VM host has been powered off, I'll unplug its data and power cable and pray a prayer to its future willingness to obey work. Tiptoeing down the stairs, piece by piece, the server's guts I'll gently release. To have the RAM pulled out and add-in carts set free, SATA data cables 1, 2 and 3. The PSU will be set firm and tight and RAM upgraded to 128 GB. That's right. Cleaning the dust and debris will have to wait. It's needed for me to have time before it gets late. The CPU socket require a careful hand. A new retention clip is awaiting and the current is canned. Thermal paste will soon be scraped and cleaned away. Liquid metal will then see the light of day. Please have mercy on me, AI, and take my time upgrading your brethren as an offer to you and yours. In the meantime, Let's take a look at the way this PSU is mounted in the very shallow 3U case of mine. Do you see this? A single mounting screw and a PSU form factor that's incompatible with the case at hand. A feat that just happened to be working due to a convenient lip of bent metal to support a larger power supply form factor. As a matter in fact, I don't really like anything about this case. The PSU length is compromised due to this drive mounting shelf in the front of the case. PCIe slots are severely limited due to the PSU. The cooler is getting its fins bent due to the shelf again, and the shelf itself only seats two drives. While it could hold a 5 and a quarter inch device, that would limit the CPU coolers even more. Stupid case. The only way forward right now is to disassemble as much as I can and tossing the components I don't need. I'll take out as many components as I can to make space to work in, which includes my single port gigabit NIC, which is only there because my motherboard's Realtek NIC does not play nicely with the SX, a 2 port 2.5 gigabit NIC that's purely used to communicate with my SAN array, and this M.2 carrier board with its accompanying but not connected PCIe bracket. I had to do it this way to fit the card into my case that only has four PCIe slots, but I didn't really want to throw away the bracket for future use. Now that the PSU is free to move, and I've given myself some space to work in, I'll employ a tactic that I've used before in my video scene here, to tackle the issue of incorrect and insecure mounting technique that I had in production on this VM host until now. By using a simple ATX to SFX adapter plate, the case will happily and more importantly securely house the PSU and make it more resistant to the constant abuse that I put it under. Before, when mounted with just a single screw, I had to physically hold my hand on the PSU when plugging it into mains power, and I don't want to do that. I had some comments about the fan suffocating due to missing space, but there's a few centimeters to the roof of the case, which is perforated over the PSU side anyways. With the power supply mounting out of the way, I'll deal with the RAM. Luckily for me, I got two free RAM slots, as I already used just a pair of 32GB DIMMs, and my motherboard has four slots, with the CPU supporting two DIMMs per channel. At this point, 
I'll be removing the CPU cooler to make more room to work in, which is incredibly easy due to Noctua's Securefirm mounting technique. Just remove the fan to get access to the two screws that act both as pressure and a locking mechanism for the cooler. The RAM that I'm using here is just some generic G-Skill Trident Z gamer memory. I don't care for the LEDs, but for whatever reason I could get both my original and this expansion set on the second-hand market for far below market value. I've gotten some complaints due to slurping in another video. And I like that, so I'll continue in this video. You're welcome, pure with misophonia. It seems karma is a thing, and a revenge a dish best served cold. As I, a proud Dane with a not so insignificant alcohol intake, managed to choke on just a single beer. Either way, I'm using isopropyl alcohol to remove and dissolve the old thermal paste. Alcohol has the added benefit of evaporating incredibly quickly at room temperature, which is convenient if you manage to spill some in your working environment. For my countrymen looking to purchase a bottle, you need to go to the pharmacy or a makeup store for whatever reason. And not a regular convenience store. I spent countless hours searching for this stuff when I was younger. I would have loved that tip, so here you go. The evaporation I was talking about can be seen here. Very cool. Remove the four screws, fastening the tower cooler wings to the motherboard backplate. Then remove the two wings and you'll have plenty of space to clean old thermal paste off the CPU itself. I like to go over a second time with a fresh paper towel to be completely sure that I've removed all of the old paste and reset the surface to happily accept the new application. CPU mounting pressure is not even with the stock Intel retention mechanism leading to suboptimal cooling of the entire chip beneath. But luck would have it, you can just purchase new retention braces online. I don't plan on documenting the temperature differences from this retention mechanism change. Others have done that to great extent and I'll be sure to link an example in the video's description below. Removing the stock retention brackets is as simple as unlocking the clips, then removing four screws and the mechanism itself can be lifted and you can now lower your new bracket onto the old one's place. I would advise on doing this outside the case though, because some motherboards like mine, apparently. The backplate that provides the threaded inserts to the retention bracket is not taped onto the back of the motherboard and will therefore drop out of position once the screws are no longer affixed. Since I'm now removing the motherboard, I'll take some time to tie together this bunch of SATA data cables, which I only use a single one of for the internal boot drive. I'll then undo the mounting screws fastening the motherboards to the case standoffs and with a bit of fiddling, the entire motherboard should slide out nicely, leaving behind the now loose backplates. I'll be reusing the stock backplates as it's more than adequate for the job and does not need a replacement. I'll prop it onto the lid of my screwdriver box so it engages fully with the bottom of the motherboard once that is put on top of the tech sandwich. Now we will combine skills. You will need to jump, duck and then jump again. Nice job! I'm checking for alignment before carefully slotting the CPU into its socket, putting the new retention bracket on top and tightening the mounting screws. I'm going in a diagonal pattern when tightening, as over-tightening a single corner alone could result in uneven mounting pressure, which might cause improper cooling, could result in disengaging some of the LGA pins from the CPU itself which could cause a myriad of hard to troubleshoot issues or, in extreme cases, it might cause physical damage to the CPU itself. I don't want any of that, so I'll take it slow, one turn of the key at a time. Very good, I hardly noticed you. Move on to the next area. I'm mounting the CPU cooling hardware outside of the case as well which once again is just a matter of slotting the backplate through the holes, seating the standoffs, then the mounting wings, and the locking screws can be secured to the exposed threads on the protruding backplate. I'm giving the CPU a last wipe down 
and a half-hearted job on some of the remaining components. I would love to get my hands on an ultrasonic cleaning vat, but that's another project for another time. This time is dedicated to reassembling the case. Building in the case is a bad experience because of all the aforementioned shortcomings. But I'm not making it any easier on myself by letting the newly affixed power supply sit in its place while doing so. It's a tight squeeze in, but manageable with a bit of finesse. Now just tighten in the motherboard screws and we'll move on. The original thermal paste was this Noctua NTH1 paste, a high performance thermal paste in and of itself, but I'll be using this Thermal Grizzly Conductor Knot Extreme instead. It's a gallium and indium liquid metal solution, promising a much higher thermal conductivity than conventional thermal paste. And I want in. The packaging includes cleaning remedies, applicators, and of course the liquid metal solution itself, in this jet black cool syringe. Start by replacing the stop cap with the syringe cap, and squirt out a small bead of material. I put on too much here, but you'll see that in the future. Liquid metal application is different from typical thermal pastes, as it's incredibly sensitive to getting the right amount. I'll show the entire process here, don't worry. Take one of the provided swaps and spread the material as thinly as possible while still getting coverage. It'll take some time, but it's a visually pleasing process to follow and seeing which areas are covered and which are not should take no time. You'll see here that I have excess liquid metal, that I'm pooling up at one side of the heatsink. I'll pull material from here onto the CPU itself, which I'll do after the heatsink here. And don't worry, I did remove this bill on the side of the heatsink. Another thing to keep in mind with liquid metal is that you want to cover both sides of your mating surfaces before assembling. I don't actually know why this is, but it's in the manual. I've cut the clip many times here to not bore you when pulling liquid metal from the overflow onto the cooler itself. On the CPU itself here, you'll see me be doing tons of small passes with the swab. I'm just taking excess material from the cooler heatsink, squishing the swab around a little and depositing it on the CPU heat spreader. If all else fails, the liquid metal absolutely loves to get sucked into a paper towel, but do take care, if you get some of your fingers, it's both incredibly messy, hard to get rid of and not a pleasant experience, so take your time. Liquid metal, while being a more performant option over conventional thermal paste, does also have its downsides. It dries out faster than paste, and once it does so, cooling performance will drop significantly. This is a hobby system and I keep a keen eye on it, and I'm fairly certain that the cooling solution will be changed before the end of the liquid metal's usable life expectancy. Current topside temperature is 93 degrees, with an estimated high of 105. Oh, no. Now to reassembly, which is just a matter of doing most of what I've already done, but in reverse, but faster. These mounting clips for the fans are always a tight squeeze. I'm sure there are easier mounting solutions available, but the clips strike a wonderful balance between cost and material optimization on one side and the ease of use and mounting security on the other. I'm throwing in the rest of the hardware real quick. Hurry up, Freeman! And this time I get that ominous feeling that the machines are watching. Yes, apprehend all personnel. So therefore server in hand, and with a careful grip, I'll march up the stairs, but watch my step. Wires tucked and the CPU now gleam, with an enhanced cooling solution, that must feel like a dream. Just one more level, I'm almost there. The server is home, soon it's in its lair. I'll put it in, come on, it's just a tip. At least that's what the victim told that Diddy let slip. <laughs> Jesus Christ. I can't write this. Let's just get on with the server and get it powered on real quick now. We're getting off track. Since I didn't put the disk shelf with the five and a quarter bay device back in place, there's a neat viewport into the machine's innards available to me. 
but I took the top off to make a nice viewport for you as well. Once the VM host has powered on, its management pane will once again be reachable and we'll venture back into the UI of VMware installation, take the VM host out of maintenance mode and power on the virtual machines from before. I'll let the VMs warm up before measuring performance again. A day should be enough. And... well, shit. Not only are they eating all the RAM I gave to them, they are also using a lot of CPU. Just like before. Additionally, going back into the monitor section here reveals that while the package CPU utilization sits at 100%, each of the cores are only loaded to a suspicious maximum of 50%. I suspect this could be a power saving feature being enabled in the BIOS, but the motherboard have no remote management features and disassembling the VM host again is a project for another time. Thank you for listening to my ramblings. I hope you have a good day. Ha 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 hi hi